Welcome to the online worship service of Beautiful Savior Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm Peter Schmidt. I have the great privilege of serving as pastor here at Beautiful Savior. I want to thank you for making it a priority in your day to join me for worshiping our Lord as we continue our Easter celebration, week two of Easter. You might recall from your Bible history, Jesus appeared to the disciples on Easter night but one of the 11 was not there, Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas because he doubted the words of the others that Jesus was alive. But the others remained patient with Thomas, and Thomas was with him the next week when Jesus again appeared. And this day, Jesus will come among us through his word as his spirit would work among us who find ourselves sometimes like Thomas, sometimes doubting that Jesus is Lord and God, that all things are in his hands, because, well, the world is very challenging, very difficult. But Jesus comes to us through his spirit, through the word today, to remind us not to be afraid. Everything is in his hands. And he, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, leads us through this life as Almighty God to bring us right where he wants us to be, in the Father's house. And so our worship begins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. If Christ is our hope in this life only, we are to be pitied more than all other people. But now Christ was raised from the dead, the first in the harvest of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me will live, even if he dies. Yes, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon this earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Name be sung through every land. 
As we get into our family story through our scripture readings, our first reading today is from Revelation chapter 1. St. John writes, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. As we continue with our family story, we read from John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, 
he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came, and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Welcome to Papa Time with Pastor. I am here before our beautiful altar area with all of the nice Easter flowers yet. The tomb in the background, very much empty, except for the angel announcing the good news that Jesus is alive. And I'm here with our friend Wilma, our woodpecker. How you doing, Wilma? I am great. I am fantastic. You are fantastic because I heard you singing before. I love to sing. You love to sing. I thought woodpeckers only did the, well, you know, pecking on wood thing. You mean like this? Um, yeah, 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 that's kind of what I mean. But maybe this isn't the best part to do that. I, you don't need to be doing some pecking on our communion rail like that. Well, Pastor, how about if I sing? Um, okay, how about if you sing? What would you like to sing? Hark the herald angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing. We're, we're in the middle of the Easter season. We just sang East, Easter hymns last week, and we're still celebrating Jesus being alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Indeed, alleluia. But how come you're singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing? That's a Christmas song. Now listen to it. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Okay. Sounds like Christmas to me. Um, why are you thinking about that hymn today? You're a pastor. Figure it out. You puppets always say that. I'm a pastor. Figure it out. Well, help me out. Um, how come you're thinking about it? Well... When Jesus was among the disciples, when he came among them, and we just heard in that reading, what did he say? Oh, peace be with you. That's what he said. Peace on earth and mercy, my old God and sinners reconciled. Yeah, you're right. God and sinners reconciled. He told the disciples all about how they would forgive people's sins in his name, but the first thing he said to them was, Peace be with you. Oh, man, that's cool. I get it now. Christmas and Easter kind of go together. Jesus came to this earth to bring peace, peace with God and human beings. But, well, mm, is there any other Christmas song that you were thinking about? How about you? You tell me about a Christmas song that goes with this. Hmm, you put me on the spot. Well, maybe this is more of an Advent song, but we sing it at Christmas. How about if I whistle it and see if you can figure out what it is? Okay. 
Don't want to sing? Mm, no, not really. I get it, I get it. I know what it is, I know what it is. What is it? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean, remember? God with us. Yes, God with us. Indeed. Why do you pick that one? You're a woodpecker. Figure it out. Stop it. All right. Well, the idea is, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, when Jesus came, do you remember what Thomas said? Thomas, who didn't believe Jesus was alive unless he would see the marks in his hands and put his hand in the side where the spear went. What happened when Jesus came and he saw Jesus? Remember what he said? My Lord and my God. Exactly. He was saying that Jesus is God. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God's come to us in Jesus. Jesus is really God. And what can God do? Anything. Indeed, God can do anything. And what does God want to do for us? Mm. Oh, I know. I know. What? Bring peace. Reconciliation. Bringing us back to God. Forgiveness. Yep. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he rose. And that's what he wanted the disciples to know. And that's what he wants us to know. God and sinners brought together. He wants to be in our midst. Peace be to us. Because God is with us. That's an amazing thing. That where we go, God goes. Right there with us. Jesus is God. Hmm. You know, I see what you have here that you were doing here. Yeah, I got to finish it. Let me finish it. All right. All right. You know, I guess it's not so bad. Because what you wrote here is a heart, and it says, Jesus loves you. Yeah, Jesus does love us. God so loves us that he came to this earth to save us. So we can have peace with God, and if we have peace with God, we can have peace in life. Knowing where we go, Jesus goes with us. And if Jesus goes with us, who's going with us? God! And what can God do? Anything! Indeed, anything. What a wondrous God. How good it is to celebrate, even with Christmas songs, that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! Indeed, alleluia. Let's join in the next hymn. sons and daughters of the King, whom heavenly hosts in glory sing. Today the grave has lost its sting. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. When Tom is first, the tidings heard that they had seen the risen Lord. He doubted the disciples' word. Alleluia, alleluia. My pierced side, O Thomas, see, and look upon my hands, my feet, not faithless, but believing me. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. No longer Thomas then denied He saw the feet, the hands, the sight You are my Lord and God, he cried 
I love hearing about the Apostle Thomas. Thomas, according to church tradition, really reliable church tradition, made his way to India where he shared the saving gospel and many came to faith. What an amazing transformation from one who did not believe on Easter night that Jesus was indeed alive, who a week later was able to see the wounds and if he wanted to, could have touched them and even put his hand in Jesus' side, and now declares, my Lord and my God. But what I really enjoy about Thomas is Thomas just kind of lays it out there. So as many of you know, I have the privilege of teaching religion class and history class for 7th and 8th graders here at Beautiful Savior Lutheran School. And there are some times where I will ask them, Hey, do you understand what I'm saying here? Do you get this? Any questions about anything? And they all kind of nod their heads, yeah, yeah. And then the test comes, and I find out that in effect, no, they really didn't understand it, but they were afraid to say anything. They just kind of went along with things. It's easy to do that in life. It's hard for us sometimes to share our opinions or to ask questions because we're kind of afraid of what everyone else is going to ask. But that's not how it is with Thomas. He just kind of lays it all out there. We're introduced to Thomas in an account about another grave, not Jesus' grave that was empty on Easter, but the grave of a man named Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha from Bethany. In John chapter 11, we hear that Jesus has received word that the one he loves, Lazarus, is gravely ill. But Jesus does not immediately drop everything and go to Bethany. Instead, he waits some time. And then, later on, he lets the disciples know that it's time to go, because Lazarus has now died. We read in John 11, the disciples saying, But Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Lazarus is dead, Jesus said, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. There's Thomas, laying it all out, not acting as if there's not an issue there, but being very blunt about it. The reality of death is all around us. Thomas got it. Thomas understood that Jesus' popularity was waning among the leaders of the people. And in fact, because of their jealousy, they wanted Jesus dead. But Thomas is willing to go. We know what happened there, how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Can you imagine how Thomas and the others reacted when they saw this one who had been in the grave for four days, now very much alive and well. So that you may believe, Jesus said. And indeed, who would not want to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be the resurrection and the life? We hear about Thomas a few chapters later in John's account, this time in John chapter 14. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. 
If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? There's Thomas, unlike maybe my students who nod their heads in agreement when I ask them if they know what I'm talking about, do you understand? And in reality, they might not understand. Here's Thomas being really a good student saying, Lord, I don't get it. I don't know where you are going. How can I then know the way? Jesus responds, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Now listen to this, what Jesus says here. From now on, you do know him. You do know the Father and have seen him. How have they seen God? In Jesus. Jesus is making this bold claim that he, in fact, is God. When you see Jesus, you see God. You see, sometimes people say, well, I believe in God and in Jesus, and I think they still probably mean that Jesus is God to them, but think about it. If Jesus is God, then I don't have to say I believe in Jesus and in God. I believe in God that Jesus is God. But that's hard to believe when you look at the cross. You know, for us who know the story, and in many cases have been brought up in the faith, we see the cross as this wondrous place of love and mercy, where the sacrifice was offered to cover the guilt of our sin, perfect God giving his all for imperfect human beings, the creator redeeming his creation. But put yourself in the place of Thomas and the other disciples. Yes, everything was laid out by the prophets. Yes, Jesus talked about that he would suffer and die, but on the third day rise. But when you go through seeing the brutality of crucifixion firsthand, and when you see a body unceremoniously taken down, and then in the midst of mourning and grief put into a grave, whose entrance is sealed, it's kind of hard to see God there. And so we can understand, can't we? We can understand why the disciples found themselves in that room behind locked doors, because they were afraid of what was going to happen. They might be next. They went after the leader. Now they would go after all the ones who followed him. Who wouldn't be afraid? It'd be nice for us to say, well, I wouldn't be. I'd be really bold. I'd be really strong. But really, there's an interesting quote I wish to share with you from Roger Fredrickson. In his commentary on John and on this particular passage about the disciples being behind locked doors, he talks about the current day Christian church. Here's what he says. How often the contemporary church finds itself behind closed doors, fearful and ineffectual, living on the wrong side of the resurrection. The problems are so vast and the enemy so overwhelming and all the talk about Jesus seems futile. What can be done but hide in the sanctuary discussing how desperate the situation is? He's correct, isn't he? We can easily find ourselves worrying about all the latest conspiracy theories, the global reset. What's going to happen when all the politicians are trying to wipe out Christianity? What's going to happen if this Antichrist truly arises in our midst? What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? The Ukraine, World War III on its way? And what about wokeism? And what about all the other things going on which seem to be canceling our culture? 
What we hold on to is near and dear. What was once considered good, now considered evil. What was considered evil, now considered good. And so we spent a lot of time talking about all those problems and how they are rising against the church and how we must combat those things, but how often we leave out Jesus. And we do it in our personal lives too, don't we? We don't have to worry about all the other issues in the world to look at ourselves and see what if problems. What if this or that continues to fall apart because I've made some bad decisions and I'm living with guilt and shame and can't seem to change it? And what happens if the investments I've made tank with the economy? And what happens if this relationship I'm in continues to fall apart? And what happens if my kids continue to make bad decisions and I can't seem to control anything? And on and on and on and how it feels safe to us to try to find a place where we can be behind locked doors. But there's an issue with that, isn't there? What's the issue? Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus came and stood in their midst. Is Jesus in the midst of your locked room? the place where you find yourself trying to sort out all the issues of life and deal with all of its problems, all of your problems. And not only is Jesus in your midst, can you hear his voice? The voice that says, peace be with you. The peace he's talking about is not the world peace. We live in a sinful world. And there are going to be plenty of conflicts and problems. It's not a peace which says we should never ever be concerned about anything. But it is the peace which Paul describes in Philippians 4 as passing all human understanding. Keeping our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now you may look at this slide picture and say, oh man. That's a beautiful picture. The water is like glass. Pastor, are you thinking about vacation in summer already and paddling in your kayak with your wife and the perfect water? Well, that's always coming into my mind. It's true. But there's a reason I have this picture of water here. You might recall that there was another time when Jesus was in the midst of his disciples and they were filled with fear. It has to do with water. You might recall the account of Jesus and his disciples in the boat on the Sea of Galilee for an evening pleasure cruise, if you will. But then, as can be the case along the Sea of Galilee, all of a sudden a storm blew up and cut loose. And they were caught in the middle of the water in that boat with ferocious winds and waves. The disciples are scrambling, trying to bail the boat. The whole time, here's Jesus sleeping in the stern in the back of the boat on that cushion. Finally, they wake him up. Master, don't you care if we drown? Now, I want you to listen carefully because the English Standard Version translates Jesus' words very interestingly. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. It's interesting how they translate that word peace. It's not the same word, Greek word, that Jesus uses when he stands in the midst of that room saying, Peace be with you. But what a marvelous picture. Jesus in the midst of the ferocious storm saying, peace. Isn't that what we all need to hear? Peace be with you. Thomas needed to hear it. Thomas wasn't there that Easter night. And when the others tell him, hey, we've seen the Lord. He is alive. It's just like everyone's saying he wouldn't believe it. He needed proof. And before we start saying, oh, Thomas, how could you do it, Thomas? 
isn't it accurate to say that we also are people who like to say, show me. I need some truth to back it up. If only I'd see this, then I'd believe. Well, again, the doors were locked that next week. And what do we hear? Peace be with you. Jesus again came in the midst. The doors locked. And they thought they were safe in the midst of their fear. But Jesus came again to say, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, how we picture Jesus saying that is very important. Now, I mentioned again that I have the privilege of teaching 7th and 8th grade religion and history. And in the first day of class every year, I give them a little bit of a warning. I say, you know, if I'm in a bad mood today or you have pushed me to the point where I'm quite upset about something, I just want to show you what to watch for so you can immediately stop what you're doing and pay attention. So if I walk over to the classroom door very slowly, quietly, maybe walk out into the hallway and then find myself coming back, closing the door rather forcefully behind me and again, just kind of staring everyone down, you can pretty well be assured that we're going to have a one-way conversation at this point, and I am not happy with you. Can you imagine if that was Jesus talking to Thomas? Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Is that how you picture Jesus dealing with Thomas? Is that how you picture Jesus Dealing with you. What does Jesus begin with again? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thomas, I heard what you said. Hey, put your fingers here. You want to do it here? Here are the wounds on my hands. And how about if you take your hand and put it in my side where that spear went in? Just stop doubting. Believe, Thomas. Believe, because I want you to know the joy of peace. Now, Thomas's response is huge. Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. We have gone from rabbi, teacher, from Lord, master, to God. You are my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me, isn't it? Blessed are we when we hold on to what has been revealed to us. The faith worked in us beginning in holy baptism by the Holy Spirit that Jesus is God. We are blessed when we hold on to that. And we are blessed with peace. Do you remember at Christmas time, the angels saying to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Peace. Well, it's just like we heard in puppet time this day. The beautiful song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild, God and Sinners Reconciled. This is why Emmanuel came, why God would be with us. Jesus came, not another prophet, not an angel or messenger, but God himself came. This is what John says in the introduction to his gospel account. John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. 
In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, we know John three sixteen and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world but to save the world through him. This is the truth of his grace, his undeserved love. The creator has never stopped loving his creation. And what a wondrous God, who in a way, at least beyond my understanding, comes also now true man born of the virgin. So as true man, he can live a perfect life, which you and I could not do, and so be our substitute. And as God, offer the perfect sacrifice to cover the guilt of our sin so we can have peace, be reconciled. And so when Jesus comes to us in the midst of our rooms where we are locked up because of fear and doubt and anxiety, Jesus comes and says, peace be with you. Why? Because he is a limitless God. You see, that was Thomas's biggest issue, wasn't it? He limited God. You ever do that? Limit God? I do it. Because instead of being proactive, I'm always reactive to things. And instead of going into things, realizing I'm going in with God and coming to him in prayer and then waiting for his guidance, I just kind of push ahead. And you know what I find out? Without God, there are a lot of limits to my abilities. And there are a lot of limits to my ability to have complete strength and power. But with God, a limitless God, when I go into everything with him, and like the old hymn says, with the Lord begin your task, Jesus will direct it. When I go into everything with my Lord Jesus, I know peace. Even when he allows me to go through some very dark valleys, I go with a limitless God and I look for how he is going to flip those situations around and use them for his glory. Peace be with you, Jesus says, as he comes to you behind your locked doors. Peace be with you, Jesus says, to those who think he's just a teacher. He might be Lord and Master, but he's maybe not God. Peace be with you, he says, because I am this God who gives you the joy now of my salvation, who suffered and died, but who is very much alive and well because I hold the keys. I know how to get out of that tomb. I know how to get out of locked doors. And I know how to be right where I need to be. And right now, where is Jesus ruling all things for the good of his church? For you and me, this limitless God with limitless love. Oh, what a wondrous God who comes to you and me and says, peace be with you. Do you remember the passage we heard earlier from Revelation chapter 1? Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I became dead, but look, I am living forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of the grave. Jesus has the keys. He knows how to open the door and get us where he wants us to be. Do you remember how the disciples were in that locked room for fear of the Jewish authorities? thinking they might come and arrest them. And even a week later, when they were gathered together, the doors again locked, but Jesus has the key. You know, those locks weren't going to be on the outside where someone could pick them. They would be on the inside 
The disciples perhaps thought they were secure, but they weren't secure without one very important person, God. Jesus, very God of very God who had become true man, now showing himself among them to be very much alive and well and who he is. God Almighty. A God who no one can lock out. A God who gets where he wants to be and what does he want to do? Peace be with you. I don't know about you, I know about me. There are times where I can find myself in one of those locked rooms, trying to keep myself safe, forgetting the whole time of who my Lord Jesus is. It's as Thomas says, my Lord and my God, that limitless God, this God who knows how to open the door to come with us, and a God who knows how to open the ultimate door to the Father's house, and a God who welcomes us there through faith in him, following him. So we do that, don't we, by the Spirit's power. Thomas learned that, didn't he? The importance of Jesus' true identity, my Lord and my God, this limitless God. May the Holy Spirit continue to work that in you this week. The joy of the Lord's salvation, the joy of knowing when we say Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. It is our God who is very much alive and well, our God who goes with us, our God who brings us through this life again to get us right where he wants to be in the Father's house where we'll celebrate for all eternity because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the gift of divine peace and of pardon. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout all the world and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. And for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the situation in Ukraine, for relief for all those who have been terribly affected by the war, for an end to the hostilities and peace in our time, for all those who are seeking healing and relief from suffering and pain, for all those in the midst of doubt, worry, anxiety, and tumult, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, For these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. I want to thank you so very, very much for making it a priority in your day and joining me for worship this day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We heard this marvelous declaration of Thomas that Jesus is not only Lord, but God. Jesus is God. I challenge you through the power of the Holy Spirit to live your life that way, knowing Jesus as God, a God who is limitless, a God who does all things in love. You know, this week in our 7th and 8th grade religion class here at Beautiful Savior, I talked with my students about the difference between reactive praise and proactive praise. Reactive praise is always saying thank you, praise the Lord after good things happen. But how about if we're proactive, praising him in all situations, even before things happen, because we know who our Lord is. It is God, a limitless God, a God filled with limitless love. And so Jesus being Lord and God, very much alive and well, will go with you this week as he will go with me even as we look forward to the day when he'll bring us through this life and take us right where he wants us to be, in the Father's house. He has the keys. He opens it up for you and me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.